assignment is to uh, uh, cover uh, the things that I've been interested in and then to segue into the panel discussion that's to follow. Hopefully, um, I'll do a proper job of that. Um, you know, for thousands of generations, human beings have looked at the night sky in wonder and also in conjecture. It took tens of thousands of generations of human beings to get up to where we are now <coughs> and at the level of understanding that we have of the universe and uh, even of, of our own world. Um, the, the conjecture that these phenomena of the sky um, at times went against, um, we'll say, conventional wisdom and taboos. Uh, think uh, here relatively recently, think Galileo and the Inquisition, kind of get an idea of the taboos. But yet by the time we get to the ancient Greeks, we have a society uh, within which has individuals who are actually wondering about whether we are alone. And that if there are beings, intelligent beings, uh, somewhere else in our universe. <coughs> now, a great leap forward took place with the Copernican or scientific revolution back in the uh, 17th century that helps us uh, really get a, a focus on an understanding of the universe and humanity's place within it. Of course, it's named after Nicholas Copernicus, uh, the man who took us from the Ptolemaic uh, Earth-centered uh, universe to a heliocentric uh, view of, of our uh, solar system. In those days, it, the solar system was the universe. Uh, it had a number of key individuals. Nicholas Copernicus was one. Tycho Brahe was another. Mathematics and planetary motion and other important observations. John Kepler derived the basic laws of planetary motion, uh, indicating that orbits were ellipses. Galileo Galilei, who, with his telescopic uh, uh, observations and astronomy, supported that heliocentric view, uh, which uh, he also supported when he published his dialogue concerning uh, the uh, two chief world systems which then led to his trial and house arrest by the Inquisition, again going against a taboo, in this case a religious taboo. Uh, Giordano Bruno, who argued for an infinite universe, later supported by Descartes. And the last uh, persona that I, that I added here is Isaac Newton, who completed the scientific revolution with the publishing of the Philosophy, Naturalis, Principia, Mathematica. And among other things indicated that the planets were kept in their orbits by gravity. Now that scientific revolution uh, unifies thinking about the universe. There's a more coherent scientific and philosophical understanding of the universe and man's place within it. And it uh, reintroduces a question now with increased fervor that was first posed by those ancient Greeks, and that was, are we alone? <clears throat> uh, early discourse in this question uh, uh, that blossomed in the 17th century was through this book, The Plurality of Worlds, which was written by Bernard Le Gouvier de Fontenelle, and that's as good as the French gets. Um, in this book, he explains uh, the heliocentric model and, uh, on, and also further discusses the possibility of extraterrestrial life. A unique thing about this book is that this is written in common terminology. It's common language. It's actually kind of a novella where the, <coughs> the philosopher is taking a walk in a garden with, with some young woman. And this is the, the topic that they are, or the topics that they're dealing with. Now, at this time, uh, we have minimal instrumentation. 
or observationally, observationally answering, getting an answer to this question, are we alone? And so a little different tack was taken initially. And that was the first attempts were to call attention to our presence and then see if there was a response from off-world, principally <coughs> places that were close to us, like the moon, Mars, and Venus. Actually, they referred to the inhabitants of the moon and Mars. <coughs> One of my favorite books, uh, um, uh, or I should say favorite movies, uh, talked about what involved the trip to the moon in 1899, and the selenites, which kind of looked like grass, kind of like grasshoppers, I'm not sure, that inhabited the moon. Uh, unfortunately, when, when the Apollo program finally got there, they found no, no signs of them whatsoever. Um, I picked out a couple of these early uh, proposals at uh, communication with other planets, starting with uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss, who, uh, who, po who uh, put forward this notion of constructing the outline of the Pythagoras, and that's this collection of geometric shapes out in the tundra of, of uh, <coughs> Russia, or even cutting uh, pathways through uh, the uh, forest and revealing these shapes. Um, Littrow, von Littrow, talked about, this is kind of a crazy thing, digging circular, well, I'm not saying anything else isn't crazy either, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> digging circular canals up to 30 kilometers in diameter in the Sahara, filling them with water, I'm not sure where that's coming from, and then floating uh, fuel oil, kerosene on top, and igniting it at night, and then sitting back and waiting to see if there's a response from off-world. Uh, Charles uh, Cross uh, put forward the notion of uh, celestial calligraphy using light beams, using uh, one or more uh, powerful electric lights uh, focused on parabolic mirrors, and use them to exchange some kind of repetitive signals. We work out some kind of code over time with the inhabitants of Mars. And Venus. Of course, uh, something that was pointed out uh, earlier uh, by David, the famous uh, Nikola Tesla also thought it might be possible to send signals to Mars by means of extremely powerful electrical discharges. He, he postulated there was a medium between the planets that would carry uh, this electrical charge. Well, then the uh, excitement in, uh, in the notion of uh, uh, extraterrestrial civilizations really gets a kick up when we get to the end of the 19th century. Start with uh, Chef Rally. The man spent 20 years uh, studying Mars. He constructed these, uh, these uh, interesting maps. Um, first thing, yeah. He, uh, and he noted, he was the first to notice these linear features. And he thought that they were uh, natural geological features. And he called them channels. And of course, he called them channels in Italian, Denali. And when, whenever it got, uh, got translated into English, it, it became canals. And of course, this excited a lot of people, but none more so than Percival Lowell, mm -hmm. who, uh, a very charismatic, uh, wealthy, imaginative person, who uh, became enchanted with Mars uh, at this, uh, at this uh, day and time. Uh, built that wonderful observatory near Flagstaff and went on to detect on his own through that telescope about 500 canals on Mars as well as a couple of hundred dark circles that he called oases. And uh, then he went on to, to postulate then that, that there was an advanced civilization there. The canals were for moving water, uh, especially from the polar regions down into the really dry mid-latitude so they could raise crops, and etc. He wrote a number of books that were fairly popular today. Mars, Mars and its canals, Mars as an abode for life. Of course, um, this also is something that these conclusions were kind of problematic because they were very difficult, like impossible to substantiate. And uh, this introduced something into the field 
that has bedeviled uh, the whole field of, of, uh, of thinking about extraterrestrial life ever since, and that's the giggle factor. Uh, politicians love to latch on to this. Uh, I'll talk a little bit here later on about the demise of the NASA program because of the giggle factor, or we'll say perceived giggle factor. Okay, in 1959, we have a game-changing seminal paper. This is the first paper to be published on the SETI discipline. And uh, I'm going to say it's Coccioni, close? Coccioni. Okay, Coccioni and <laughs> Philip Morrison, I know, I know that one. <coughs> Both who were at Cornell University wrote uh, this paper, Searching for Interstellar Communications. And this paper uh, is really still quite valid in that it lays out the ground rules of basically how to conduct a, a search uh, in, in the uh, microwave region uh, for uh, the presence of extraterrestrial technical civilizations. Um, it's still a blueprint for modern SETI, with the exception of the fact that modern SETI is also transitioned into optical SETI as we're looking for the laser beams and other things uh, uh, that's going back and forth between star systems. Uh, they selected this unique frequency, the, the water hole there down at the neutral, neutral hydrogen, 21 centimeters, <coughs> rounded off 1,400 <coughs> megahertz. Uh, they expected the signal to be pulse, uh, pulse modulated to be long duration, maybe even years, and to be repetitive. That is, if someone is trying to contact the rest of the universe. Uh, really, it's more reasonable to think that signals that we might pick up would be incidental signals as a result of just the, er the ongoing everyday of civilization. About years ago, uh, when I was in the military, we worked with, uh, uh, I worked in the intelligence field, and one of the things we would do is make very powerful radar units. Uh, we projected 10 million watts. And uh, in order to uh, calibrate the things, one of the things we used to do was pan across the surface of the moon and map the profiles of the craters. Okay, well, you can beam that on out into space, too, as you're trying to find the moon on your first or second attempt. And uh, those things are probably more likely. That could be, uh, someone mentioned earlier, I think it was Greg uh, Matloff, and that was the wild segments. Things just kind of pop up, they're non-repetitive, and you never find them again. Um, let's see. And then uh, they also picked out a target list, 15 light years. There are uh, seven stars with luminosity and lifetime similar to our own. And four of them lie in the direction of low background there in the southern declination. Well, at the same time as this paper came out, Frank Drake, a newly minted PhD out of Harvard, got the job at the, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Greenback, West Virginia. And he was already planning a, a SETI search at two of the four nearby stars that the, that the Morrison and Coccone Coccone paper had, uh, had, uh, uh, had mentioned. So for a few weeks in the spring of 1960, Drake's Project Osma was undertaken using uh, Greenbank's Brent Spank and New Howard Tunnel, 85-foot, uh, 23 meter dish. Uh, 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 it looked at a, a narrow band of frequencies surrounding hydrogen's emission line, and this is the birth of observational SETI. Um, he did succeed in uh, picking up a transient signal two, two, two nights in a row, emanating from an unknown aircraft, cruising at an unheard of altitude, 80,000 feet. What he had done was he had discovered secret flights, testing flights of the U-2. And he did select, he did choose not to publish what he found because he rather suspected that it was military in nature and they probably didn't knock at his door if he tried to publish it. Well, a year after Project Osma, Drake convened a meeting of about a dozen individuals at Green Bank. And uh, <coughs> this group eventually would take on this term, the Order of the Dalton, because one of the attendees actually uh, worked in uh, research in the area of dolphins. And it was for a week-long discussion centering on seven topics. 
that involve various astrophysical, biological, technological, and societal aspects of the potential emergence of interstellar communication with other worlds. And he strung those topics together in a multiplicative model, which became known as the Drake Equation. Uh, basically, what this thing is is not something that you're going to sit down and solve, but it's something to guide your thinking process. Though it, we might actually arrive at a point where we can solve it, because uh, some of these some of these uh, uh, factors are actually being filled in, like. Uh, the R star, the average rate of star formation, I guess it's about one a year now in our galaxy. Uh, the fraction of those stars that have planets, uh, and we get a little later on here, and the planetary searches, Kepler, Hartz, and others, you find out that an awful lot of stars have planets. Um, the average number of, of planets that can support life and so on. Those that go on to develop intelligence, those that develop interstellar communication, and how long those uh, uh, intelligences will release those signals out into the cosmos. Another way of also looking at that right there is the length of your technological civilization. And of course, this was the infamous black box. And this equation came out because this is, you know, we are so deep into the Cold War and, and the nuclear genie, and who's gonna use it, and are we gonna avoid it, that sort of thing. So that was a, a rather major question mark. But we've had a half century now of SETI science. Uh, NASA had a, pro a, a, a program from 71 to 93. At its peak, it ran $12.6 million a year. Uh, the program was ended just one year into a 10-year observational <coughs> cycle that it had started. It's looking at these huge multi-channel spectrum analyzers, best antenna available. They're looking at the whole sky and Congress saw it as something easy to chop. Of course, uh, prior to this, uh, I guess it was in the 80s, uh, the SETI project in NASA received the infamous uh, Golden Fleece Award from William Proxmire. Um, and the following year, funding, funding was zeroed out. Funding got restored by the personal intervention of Carl Sagan, who went to Proxmire and sat down, and you know how, how uh, how persuasive Carl Sagan could be, man, he's an amazing individual. Uh, but he didn't sway him to his point of view. All they did was get him to commit to not oppose the bill, the funding bill. And then it was funded for a couple more years, and then some other people from Congress decided it was time to cut it. Well, since then, we've had the privatization of SETI. That's given rise to the SETI League and the SETI Institute. Uh, it's grown from from the microwave region, we have uh, optical SETI, and so on. So, uh, and, and a lot of uh, a lot of resources. Uh, recently, I guess uh, I read that uh, there's a chance they're going to lose the uh, uh, the uh, uh, antennas that belong to Berkeley. Uh, but they'll pick up they'll pick up time on other on other antennas somewhere else. They did a fundraiser and they they uh, brought it back. They actually went down for a couple of months and then they. Fundraiser in their backup. So, Jody Foster, I believe. Jody Foster? Yeah. I should hope so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, gonna, gonna transition here to filling in the blanks of, of the Drake equation. We're gonna do this through observations, both ground based and spaceborne, and modeling. It takes in various aspects of astronomy, astrophysics, biology, geology. Uh, Areology you can think of, I guess. And uh, a picture then being built in which both galactic habitable zones and stellar habitable zones are being hypothesized. Uh, the galactic habitable zone, uh, it's long been thought, you know, it, it, it's basically been postulated to be a ring. It's about 6,000 light years in diameter. It sits outside of the central bulge. Uh, why is that selected? It has to do with the combination of the metallicity of stars. You've got to have a certain metallicity if you're going to have planetary formation. Uh, uh, stellar density. Um, one of the things that's uh, precluded the thinking about going into the, the central bulge into the inner part of the galaxy is, is uh, a nasty event, especially supernova. 
difference is the type 2 supernova, when it decides to light up, uh, will sterilize at least biology like us uh, in an area, uh, in a zone up to 8 parsecs in diameter. So if you've got a high stellar density, we're kind of lucky. We're out here in kind of the suburbs, actually we're in the <laughs> suburbs. We're out right on the edge of the countryside here. And so we, uh, the, the statistical chance of being subjected to this is really rather low. Our case is very low. Uh, a recent paper, though, by uh, Galois and co-workers <coughs> suggests that the zone should actually be spread into the central bulge as well. And uh, I think it's the December issue of Astrobiology, but I won't swear to it. Uh, also, they do some modeling and they predict that 1.2% of all stars host a planet that's capable of, of uh, sustaining complex life. Um, also, I think it's 0.03% uh, of all planets have a, have a, uh, of all stars have a planetary body in the Goldilocks zone that is not tidally locked. So it's freely rotating uh, like our own planet. Uh, stellar habitable zone, this is, this is a real simplistic view of it. Uh, it would be a zone basically where, uh, uh, that would allow for liquid water to exist. Uh, at the real simplistic level, it's uh, simply uh, a matter of how hot the star is and how far away from it you are. Of course, there's a lot more to it. Most of it has to do with planetary conditions, atmosphere, and so on. We're not, we're not going to talk about that. Uh, actively searching for exoplanets. Um, first exoplanet was discovered in 1991. It uh, orbited this pulsar, B1257 plus 12. Uh, first planet around the main sequence star was 51 Pegasi B. It was discovered in 95. There currently there are two uh, wildly successful uh, programs for finding planets around other stars. The first is HARPS, uh, High Accuracy Radial Velocity Planet Searcher. This is a spectrograph that's fitted to a 3.6 meter uh, telescope at the ESO's La Silla Observatory in Chile. It measures radial velocities to an accuracy of one meter per second. So uh, as a star has a planet going around it, you get this wobble in the star, and you get this, this Doppler shifting, and uh, that's, what, that's what HARPS measures. Uh, currently, they have a list of close to 600 planets, uh, potential planets with more than 150 confirmed. Second is NASA's Kepler mission, uh, which is a, a big, uh, 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 it's a telescope in space. It's got uh, 42 CCD uh, elements on it. It's to determine uh, the frequency of Earth size and larger planets in the habitable zones of sunlight stars and determine their, their size and orbital period. Again, it's 42 CC, CCDs. It stares constantly at a field with 156,000 stars in it. Um, right here we are out in, the, out in the suburbs, and it looks into an area here about 3,000 light years. Uh, it's slightly above plane of the ecliptic to lower the, uh, uh, lower the background from uh, stars that are, that are in behind. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that this thing works by transient light curves. You get this little drop due to sunshade effect as the planet goes by. As of November 15th, it had uh, 1,235 uh, candidates, 25 of them confirmed. And this is this is the pattern that the, the CCDs look at, and uh, the various uh, planetary <coughs> candidates that they have found thus far. Okay, after 50 years of SETI service, searches, in light of the evidence of the existence of hundreds of planets within 300 light years of us, and you know, with this elucidation of uh, stellar habitable zones, and the galactic habitable zone, there's still no evidence that exists of the presence of other communicating civilizations in the galaxy. There are possible exceptions. Uh, my favorite is the WOW, and one of the 30 or so WOW signals, the one from uh, August of 1977. But that's going to take me back to what we're going to use to segue into, into the next uh, hour, and that is the Fermi paradox. Because this lack of finding signals <laughs> plays right into the Fermi paradox. In the summer of 1954, scientists, these four guys right here, Fermi, Teller, Yurkin, and Konopinski, 
are walking to Fuller Lodge at Los Alamos. They're going for lunch. And they're having a discussion uh, about a cartoon that appeared in the New Yorker uh, that, that was trying to explain two current things in the news. One was uh, the sightings of UFOs, and the second thing was the disappearance of public trash cans off the streets in New York. And the editorial cartoonist came up with that. Fleeing the spaceships, and they're at their home planet there. They come to Earth. It was a raid. They came to steal New York City's trash can. <laughs> and during this conversation, Fermi says, "Well, where is everybody? Where is everybody?" And that's the Fermi paradox. You know, it's a verbalization of the contradiction between the probability <coughs> estimates of extraterrestrial civilizations and the lack for any evidence. And this is what we're faced with, the great, science, the great silence. And the question is, why? Thank you very much. We're not asking him to solve the answer to the Fermi paradox. Are there any questions about uh, the rest of the talk? Yeah. Well, first of all, let me congratulate you, please, because your presentation was <coughs> Detailed and, and excellent in all regards. They work in the city business. They've been working for 20 years. So, uh, let me just add some, a few more points, please. Uh, first of all, for, for you American people, just last week in Paris, we had a workshop more or less like this one, more towards city than this one. Uh, unfortunately, it was not in English, it was in French. I, I don't like that because I believe that English should be the international language. Anyway, uh, they pointed out a few more extrasolar planets that were discovered by the European mission Coral. Uh, Coral was not involved in intention to find extrasolar planets, but some of them were discovered. Uh, then let me point out that next week at NASA Ames, there will be the first. Kepler Science meeting. I'm going there, it's going to be a large conference, I don't know, there are 200 people more. So there are many more poster papers than people are allowed to give talks, because there are so many. But that's really the first big gathering of uh, scientists working in this field. And of course we are going to try to find out statistics of the extra solar planet. So this, this field is growing up tremendously. To the, to the satisfaction of every scientist involved. Thank you. I was wondering if it might be more beneficial to science to, if we look for any type of life, even though it was uh, simplistic, fundamental, like, like uh, one cell or, or, or something, you know, like lower animal and, and lower forms of you know, vegetation or, or things like that. In other words, lower, more elemental types of life might be more constructive to science in the short term. It maybe would help give us some insight into what we might do as far as searching for extraterrestrial intelligence. I think you'll find that some motivation behind NASA's programs and the European Space uh, Organization's programs. They can't go out and let the planet search. <coughs> They're looking for worlds. Of course, they're looking for worlds in the Goldilocks zone. And eventually, hopefully, through you know uh, uh, spectrometric means, we'll be able to look at atmospheres and make some conclusions about whether or not there's life there. But uh, yeah, I mean, the great silence as far as uh, at least the uh, electromagnetic spectrum communications is such that this is. The reason I ask that question is because we already know that that life that we found say at the most, at the deepest parts of the ocean on Earth, near some of the uh, vents where there's hot water coming up and things like that is, is radically different than anything anywhere else. So. There was a drilling program at uh, <coughs> uh, the Pacific Northwest at p and oh, 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and they were actually finding uh, bacteria three miles down in solid rock. Extreme of all right, well, very good. If it's okay, what we're going to do now is uh, thank you.